welcome to the Nerd Party. Hello and welcome to another episode of Missing Frames. This is the podcast where we watch all the movies we should have seen by this point in our lives. I'm your host, Sean Eastridge. We're hanging out on the Nerd Party Network, a collection of podcasts dedicated to all things entertainment. Check us out at thenerdparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Join Nerd Party and like the Facebook and Instagram. You follow on Instagram. You follow Instagram. You like Facebook. Either way, it's the Nerd Party. So today, this is the first time, this is a new first timer on this show. First time guest host, very delighted, excited, yeah. thrilled beyond all reason to have Amber Trujillo. Trujillo? You got it. You did yes. it. Trujillo. Oh my God. You got it. <laughs> and the sad thing is, I know it doesn't sound like it, but I, I know how to pronounce it. But because we hyped it up so much when, before we were recording, I just had this moment in my brain where I was like, I'm going to mess it up. It was a I'm block. It, up. it was block. a block. So, but you, I feel like you've encouraged me and you helped me. You and nailed made it. it through together. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, not only did I nail the pronunciation of your name, but I think we are going to nail this podcast episode. This is going to yes. go down in the annals of podcast episode history as one of the greats. I can feel it. I can feel it too. Do you feel it? Okay, good. I do. There's it's a energy, weird buzzing feeling. Electricity, yeah. like all these emotions, just it's all there and it's all real and it's all happening right now. But we are going to be watching a film which I haven't seen, which you have seen. I have. Yes. You have. Yes. That is Robert Zemeckis's adaptation of Carl Sagan's classic science fiction novel, Contact. Yes. So, Contact, one of, one of your favorites. Now, the book is one of your favorites. Is, yes. is the film one of your favorites? It It is in its own way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to I don't, I don't give uh, anything away, but um, Very I prefer, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be one of those people that say I prefer the book sure. only because uh, obviously like within books, you can go um, a lot deeper with uh, different things especially it being especially Carl Sagan being a cosmologist he really mm. gets into like the astronomy of everything and he he really deep dives into a lot of like this theological uh concepts and philosophical ideas so. and with a movie you're basically like, it's like book you have 400 pages or so movie you have two hours basically. right so right. all these things that. you can't quite exactly things that you kind of have to leave by the wayside things that are maybe touched on and not necessarily yeah elaborated on in an effective mm. way but i have so i i've read the book like i read um it's the only carl sagan i've read but wow. you i mean first of all i want to give the floor to you because you are the carl sagan person not only are you the carl sagan person but you're like an outer i was gonna say an outer space nut which sounds terrible <laughs> but you're like an out like you are like i i don't think that gives you enough credit and really speaks to how awesome you are it doesn't it doesn't speak to how crazy i am about no, well, that too but crazy is nut. crazy is great crazy is good it's okay especially on missing frames we're fans of crazy so i but like you are on, like i've listened to you talk about outer space and mm -hmm. you do it for work and you do it mm -hmm. on your social media but mm -hmm. it's like you have this real passion for it and this real love of it and you're like exactly the person i want to talk about this kind of movie with or carl sagan like nerd out about him with yeah. so but i wanted to ask you just in terms of your love for him your obsession with mm -hmm. the subject of space and travel mm -hmm. and ex exploration and things like that like what got you into it do you remember reading Contact or like how yeah. you discovered Carl Sagan? Tell me about how you got into all this this insanity. Well, I will I will compress it down. It's really interesting. I didn't um, get into astronomy until after high school, um, and Carl Sagan reading. The Dragons of Eden is one of his books. It's the speculations of uh, human intelligence, and it. It touches on anthropology and philosophy. And this and is nonfiction. It's this not, is nonfiction. Okay. It, it kind of uh, gives a perspective on how humans developed intelligence. Um, but so when I moved to LA, I was uh, I've always been in love with libraries. So I just remember like going down the the halls of libraries and and uh, this library in um, Sherman Oaks, and um, there was a Carl Sagan book, and I picked it up and I read it and. I 
starting from when I was a kid, I always loved Outer Limits and Twilight Zone, but I didn't know that I loved space. I knew I loved asking questions. Um, my my friend, he he calls me a perpetual child, which is which is the most accurate description of me um, because I, I just don't shut up when it comes to like, well, why is this like this? And why is this like that? Sure. And I didn't draw the line between science. Honestly, I didn't think I was smart enough to be able to co- like grasp the concepts until I read uh, a book by Carl Sagan. And one of the beautiful things about um, how he was as a science communicator and just as a writer in general is he, in terms of science, he writes it like poetry. So it is very easy to grasp. And I think sometimes with science, it can kind of scare people away if you're not um, technical and if you're not super analytical. So when I started reading Carl Sagan, I was just like, wow. One, I was uh, able to grasp these really complicated concepts that he was trying to get across. And for the first time, I realized that I had never actually learned how to think, which is weird, right? Like you go to, you go to school and uh, you're, you're taught how to learn a lot of the times forced how, how to learn sure. me- wrote, wrote memorization, depending or on how you basically uh, taught how to never want to learn. You're exactly. like, this sucks. I don't want to yeah. do this anymore. Yeah. This is like forced because it has a very um, structured way of teaching. Right. And it only works for some people and it's great. And it works for some people, but people like me, um, I thought that I, oh, okay, I, I don't know how to think this way. I can never touch science. Carl Sagan kind of like taught me how to think it invited me to think critically Mm. which changed everything for me after i read carl sagan i was like oh well now i'm really interested in like quantum mechanics like what does it mean for like uh you know what is quantum entanglement and all these different things and i went down this crazy obsessive path that i've been on ever since and it's really interesting everybody i think especially as children um ask questions right that's just like innate in human nation. It's what we do. Uh, my question was, why can't I have more Superman things? Yeah, exactly. Why can't I, like, this isn't fair. I want all the Superman and my parents aren't letting me have it. That was my question. Is oh that what God. you're talking about? Like, is that Similarly, a philosophical, I mean, like Superman? If I love Superman, I should be allowed to own yeah. every Superman thing I want. It's something that really, it's a quandary, honestly. It's it's so interesting how deep children ask questions like like in a very simple way right um there's this this one person on instagram that like uh, interviews kids and, and one of the kids was like obsessed with google and he's talking about i love google internet and then he goes how does the internet know everything and like <laughs> it's a silly question at first but when you think about it it's like wow that is an insanely deep question how does the internet know everything right, right. so so i do think that like you know when you're a child, people kind of like beat that curiosity out of but you. It's but it's also like that, that, yeah, it's the lack of filter. Cause as you mm-hmm. get older and you get more insecure and you start to feel like, oh, there are right questions and wrong right. questions, you lose, right. or the filters get put in place. Like yeah. you lose that sense of curiosity and it's almost like you're embarrassed and you're like, oh, well, I guess I'm the only one who's thinking of this yeah. one. That may not actually be the case. The innocence of it is yeah. what's really special. And and I think that that filter is one of the the saddest things because um, I remember that I definitely put that up. And now as an adult, uh, one of my favorite phrases is I don't know. I don't know, mm. but let's find out. Right. So yeah. if you, if you ask, if someone were to ask me a question that I don't, don't know, it's like, it's celebrated. I don't know what that is that's something cool that we can find out together, you know, like, let's let me figure that out if I'm asking that question myself. But yeah, so now I'm just like, you know, the perpetual child that's just like, never stop asking questions. Like, Uh, let me like, let me present one question to you. Like, is there extraterrestrial life out there? Do we know? Clearly, Carl Sagan was thinking about it when he wrote contact which is interesting because and that's what i wanted to ask you you were more familiar with him than Mm -hmm. i am um but i thought it was so fascinating that he chose to write fiction at all considering so much of his stuff is obviously very academic and and like like you said engaging but like very from a scientific non-fiction perspective i remember reading contact and I, I read it for the first time just a couple years ago so when mm. I say I remember it's not that long ago it was recent um but I was reading it and reading about him and learning mm. about him and just thinking how 
cool like this is how and i think this is why he was so engaging to you and like why he is such an engaging figure in general is there's a pompousness i think or maybe a misconception of pompousness or maybe Mm -hmm. it's not a misconception when it comes to science where it's like i have all the answers i know things i'm very very smart and like you said it's more empowering to say i don't know but for somebody so thoughtful and intelligent like carl sagan Mm -hmm. to say i have all these thoughts about extraterrestrial life and how they might if there are aliens out there how they might reach out to us and how they might want to communicate with us but instead of just theorizing about it i'm going to turn it into a narrative and not just a narrative but like it's not just about like making contact with aliens and extraterrestrials but it's about this woman who is an outlier in her field who Mm -hmm. has experienced you know he's a he's a man obviously carl sagan to want to tell that story i just remember reading through it and thinking like this is a dude that I would love to hang out with because he chose to tell this story the way he did, but also put in this really lovely kind of like feminist idea, like just kind of like as somebody in this field, semi in this field, like you, I'm sure reading something like this, you were very much like, this is awesome. And this really speaks to me. Um, it's based on an actual woman that worked, uh, for SETI. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the Ellie is, I can't, her name is blank is blanking for me, but it's based on an actual someone who studied, um, who worked with radio telescopes and worked for SETI, which is an actual organization, the search for extraterrestrial, um, intelligence. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the great things about sci-fi too, that I think, uh, Carl Sagan really latched on is especially in the academic field, especially with extraterrestrials, um, searching for life because there's such a lack of evidence for it. You really want to be careful about how you um, talk about it and how you explore the idea and how you express your interest in the field because it's kind of thought of as like quacky, right? Yeah. And also it's like, oh, can't you focus on the problems that we need to fix here and now? And why are we talking about the potential for something? Right, that- which, which is so crazy to me because like when it comes down to everything that we're trying to study, I feel like humans are consistently trying to a- answer the same question. Who are we? Where do we come from? Mm-hmm. So to ask such a fundamental question and to explore like the search for life, um, which they're doing in many ways now. It's it's interesting that uh, NASA just, you know, confirmed that they're going to be looking into UAPs like in a very rote scientific way, like taking mm-hmm. all of this information of these. Um, they're called UA- UAPs. UFO is a little quirky, right? So people don't want to use that word. I want to uh, yeah. put a uh, can we put a petition to get UFOs back? Yeah, I want the UFOs. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really cool that w- that we're seeing this this kind of shift in society where we're like, okay, let's let's kind of like start to explore this idea um, a little bit more. But especially in the time that contact was written, um, you were looked at as a crazy person if you wanted to talk about aliens, sure. right? Um, so yeah, I think uh, he did it brilliantly because he was able to. Um, really stick to the kind of rigor that science demands in his writing as far as like the questions the characters asked and the way that they went about um, trying to answer those questions. But it also threw in this really lovely like um, layer of like theology and philosophy and like all of these really deep questions that we can't answer. And I think all of the best scientists in um throughout our history have admitted that they don't know right because you you only you're the the point of science is that you're constantly asking questions that lead to answers that lead to more questions um it's just like this never-ending puzzle um so to say that something is for sure like you look back in the history of science um things change right yeah and that's also the point of science is like you've get new information you go okay let's tweak this here tweak this here the past the past couple years just with covid we've seen that like in a like basically in a very very small span of time like this is what we should be doing oh wait that doesn't work let's do this instead yeah oh wait we can do that and just like very very focused and within a small window we've seen that in action like in a real extreme way yeah and people uh 
don't really get to see that that aren't in the science field right they don't right. see how science working um and that's what that that's what happened during the pandemic is is you saw science working which is funny and i read contact during the pandemic did you it was like now's the time it oh, just yeah. feels right it just wow. like when am i gonna get to read it and maybe they i won't get another chance but it did i just remember i i thought it was so cool and was so um as somebody as a writer somebody who would love to write for a living just being so in awe of yeah. like oh he's not only super smart but he can tell a really engaging yeah, heartfelt human, story yeah but that's story. what it it really is and that's what i think is so important especially yeah. to be in that field to humble yourself enough to say like i'm kind of in awe of like wanting to understand but not understanding and mm -hmm. being okay with that and that's the vibe i got from the book and really just again was just so amazed by his ability to tell a great story but also interweaving his yeah. experience and knowledge and like you know I felt like a little bit smarter after I read the book yeah yeah I mean I mean I think that's one of the greatest things about him and we were talking about this earlier the reason why people gravitate towards him is because he is so learned in so many different subjects um and why it's so important to um read outside of your field right? Um, to get like a broader perspective mm -hmm. of just life in general. So he was big into learning about uh, different religions. He was big about uh, philosophy, about anthropology, biology, like anything, realm of science. He was like trying to grab as much knowledge from life as he could in order to make um, the best perspective uh, about the world, how it, how it, how it's set up, what, what anything means. So right. I think that's why people gravitated towards him because he really it, sh it showed. Yeah. It showed in the way that he talked. It showed in the way that he wrote. It showed in so many different aspects. And that's why I think it's like so important. Um, but but going back to extraterrestrials, do you know about the Golden Record and the Voyager missions? Tell me everything. Okay. All I know about the Voyager missions is that, uh, well, this is maybe a spoiler if you haven't seen the first Star <laughs> Trek movie, but uh, one of the Voyager probes we sent out into outer space mm -hmm. does come back to try to destroy us later on oh. in an attempt to search for its creator and <gasps> you'll learn more about this when you watch star trek the motion picture oh what and i just I spoiled it for you so no, please, well, please then... forget about all of this no i that this is what what is gonna push me to watch this i didn't know that yeah. that's crazy go watch it yeah yeah so yeah, like but you will I will you will fall asleep watching it because it is very boring <laughs> the first star trek movie in a good way it's like it lulls you to sleep like a lullaby, not in a like deadening, like my life is what is life kind of way. Mm -hmm. So, but just a fair warning. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I'm excited because it's, it's <laughs> fascinated that, that the probes came back to like kill us. Um, yes. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 um, were these twin missions that uh, Carl Sagan uh, developed the golden record on it. Okay. And um, it's essentially a message in a bottle to um extraterrestrials like that's literally what it is and um it's a record a playable record and embedded within it it's very similar to contact right mm, okay. um in the sense that you have to have a certain level of um technological um, advancement in order to play it so if this landed on some if it got marooned on some planet and a primitive species came across and didn't know how to play it like they wouldn't be able to decipher it right um but uh yeah it it, it has all these different things it has a man and a woman on it to, sh to show like what humans look like it shows our place in the solar in the solar system um it it has all of these sounds um from a baby laughing to a whale. Mm -hmm. It has uh, the big music that was going on, all of these crazy, crazy things. And um, Carl Sagan actually co-wrote a lot of his books with Andrian, who is uh, his widow. Okay. Incredible writer. Uh, she was, they actually met uh, doing uh, the golden record. Yeah. All of the things that, that they have together embedded onto this record and is now in interstellar space like it's right. past past the edge of the solar system it's these spacecrafts are are 
have and reached inter- farther. Interstellar is is a term that Christopher Nolan invented. Am <laughs> yes, I correct? Yes, as far as correct. I understand. Okay, good. Yes, as he invented film and the concept of cinematic expression. Uh, as you know, Christopher and relativity Nolan. actually, yeah, all of it. Honestly, <laughs> space travel really. We need to make sure to thank our our Lord and Master Christopher Nolan. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. But <laughs> but yeah, so so it's it's floating out there, and and the hope is if someone you know um, does if someone come is out it, there, if someone yeah. is out there, they'll, they'll it pick will it up. make them not want to invade and murder us. It'll make yeah. them want to et like e- yeah. like oh let's go go be friends with them and make yeah. plants and stuff like okay plants cool. yeah <laughs> so carl sagan big thumbs up yeah. now move contact the movie let's talk a little bit about that and again have i haven't seen it i've okay. owned this film it was a present from a friend of mine he got it for me i think 2014 mm-hmm. like as a christmas present just like i got you contact and i was yeah. like oh great i've never seen contact and i still have it this is the moment the contact copy uh blu-ray copy that i own is still in its shrink wrap oh my so, god uh, i almost don't want you to open it if it's still I in its shrink wrap i want you to get I wonder a new if it's one streaming i wonder <laughs> if it's streaming anywhere but it's like it's been waiting it's been traveling with yeah. me in my life to get to this moment wow. so it's very very exciting but um content so it's it's i want to look this up because i don't know exactly where this comes in his filmography but it's robert zemeckis Mm -hmm. he directed it and robert Mm -hmm. this is the guy who did uh, romancing the stone back to the future forrest gump who framed roger like you know one of the greats one of my favorite filmmakers and this was his i think this came after forrest gump i want to say no oh yes it is so this is the next film he did after forrest gump oh wow i didn't know obviously Forrest Gump was a huge hit, won Best Picture. I think he won Best Director for it and then did Contact. So I think he was riding high on that success. And I do remember at this point, like seeing commercials for Contact as a kid and being like, oh my God, Aliens, that sounds cool. I want to see that. And then never seeing it. And then I think my parents wouldn't let me see it because even though it's rated PG, apparently (laughs) there's a point where there's like some nudity in it. And it was like, yeah, yeah. So they were like, oh, you can't watch that. And I was like, but it's it's PG. If it's PG (laughs) nudity, it's okay. But apparently not. So those were the things I knew. I knew I wanted to see it. And then um, my knowledge of the film, what little knowledge I had kind of prompted me to want to read the book. Once I learned a little bit more about the book and learned that it was like, oh, it's well worth reading. I ended up kind of doing that instead i was like well let me go read the book and i thought the book was great and now we're here watching the movie yeah. or about to watch the movie so we have a lot of love for carl sagan but without we'll get more into it obviously once we watch it and we're talking about it and critiquing it but in general do you remember the first time you watched the movie was it like oh i've got to watch it because i'm a fan of the book or did you see the movie first or how do i definitely you... saw the movie first okay. um I don't remember when I watched it. I know I rewatched rewatched it a few years ago, um, and then watched it again. But um, okay. it's one of those 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 movies that I I, I like to dissect because I mm-hmm. I love Carl Sagan so much. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't. I I definitely read Contact probably like in twenty fifteen. Okay. So I, I I don't remember the first time I watched. Contact. Contact, do you remember liking it like would you say you yeah like no it? yeah no okay. I, I like it for its own individual reasons i think that it um it touched on um the main theme mm-hmm. of the book but it, it uh yeah there are things about it that maybe just judging the the world that's listening the entire world of course is listening world. to missing frames this should be on the golden record missing yeah. frames should have gone on oh my the gosh podcast. the podcast should be on the golden record We're i just want to put that one. out there we're doing another one um but uh the entire world cannot see your expression sadly um but there is some skepticism there's some not well not skeptic that's not the right word uh, there were some shifty eyes. Let me yeah. just say that when you were like, "Yeah, it was, I liked it," and you know, contact. From what I understand, I'm, I don't want to look too much into it, but it wasn't. So it was. It had a ninety million dollar budget. It made about a hundred seventy million, which mm-hmm. is like technically just kind of breaking even as far as popularity goes. So it wasn't like it was a massive 
hit. Yeah. I think critically it did okay, but it's also like a two and a half hour long movie. So mm-hmm. I can see, especially because this is the year after Independence Day came out and yeah. like Independence Day was so huge, going to see Contact and just kind of getting a very uh, cerebral, thoughtful, two and a half hour long yeah. conversation about aliens and eventually, 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 eventually going to visit alien i can just see an audience just being like where where, when does something blow up when where's 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 will smith where's will smith punching aliens i don't like this so i there's there's this feeling of like i i remember like the critical reaction kind of being like it's all right and things like that so i'm i'm curious to see and it's been a little bit since i read the book and i always like to put some space between reading a book and watching its adaptation so that mm-hmm. it's not too in my mind so i'm right. saying this isn't in the that wasn't in the book that yeah. wasn't why didn't they do this so which is the, your opposite experience because you're very in love with the book and yeah so i'm sure you're kind of like watching it and being like how dare they well no i i i like contact uh the film because of its um it because of its thoughtfulness i think that okay. it was it was um it's a a film that approaches it more on um, the scientific reality uh, of things, but also um, really plays with the idea of extraterrestrials and mm-hmm. and what and how um, that world might look. So I love Contact by itself, but when yeah. I compare it to the book, it's I'm hard. like, it's, yeah, it's clearly gotcha. Hollywood. Hollywood I eyes. Gotcha. Yeah. And yeah, Matthew McConaughey is in it. Yeah, 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 he's yeah. He's doing his whole thing. He's doing his his his, his charming Matthew McConaughey Ma- thing. Yeah, his thing. Thing. Yeah. Um, and Jodie, Jodie Foster. Foster. I love Jodie Foster so great. much. Let I want to be her when I grow up. Me too. You and me both. Um, okay. John Hurt is in it. Yep. Angela Basket. Mm-hmm. I, I said ba- I almost basket. said basket. <laughs> yeah, uh, Angela Bassett. Excuse me. See, I'm terrible at pronounce. It's not just your last name. It's literally it's words. <laughs> literally words. All words. Tom Skerritt. Oh, is this? Wait, he was in Alien, right? Yes, he was Dallas in Alien. Another great okay. film. Another great film. A more and definitely more scientifically yeah. accurate for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I'm genuine. I I do think I'm gonna like this movie. Am I gonna love it? I don't know, but I am up for like cerebral sci-fi. Yeah. I did enjoy the book, and it's been this has been a long time coming. Contact is a film I've wanted to see since 1997. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been. I'm excited what, for you. I yeah, think I'm excited I've... for me too. You're the genius. Can you do math? Can you figure out immediately how many years it's been? Since nineteen seventy, since nineteen ninety seven, nineteen ninety seven. Maybe, uh, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. I'm don't know. actually not good at math. Um, That's fine. Which is probably Neither, why I'm not I'm a not scientist either. nor an engineer. Twenty. Wait, twenty five years. <laughs> oh my gosh, ninety seven was right? twenty five. No, ninety seven was three years ago. You're lying to me. <laughs> it's. Oh my God, where are we? <laughs> Who are we? So I am in pain, first of all, because I, I, I said 25 years out loud, but now it's really hitting me that like there was a movie out there that I wanted to see and it took me 25 wow. years to see it. Like this movie, Shame. and also really shameful, and also it's a movie that has been on my Blu-ray shelf for at least a decade, almost a decade. So well, I'm excited for you to watch it for the first I'm excited time. to watch it too. I think I'm going to enjoy it. So Let's break, we'll watch it, and then we will return to talk about it. Done. Now available to own on video cassette. And we're back. Amber, there were many, many things, many adjectives I I would presume to use when describing contact the motion picture um like before i watched it i was like you know i'm sure it's going to be contemplative and i'm sure it's going to be slow and it's going to be thoughtful and probably really stunning and things like that wacky was not a term i thought i would use but wacky Mm. is a term i'm going to use i would say this is very much um the 90s movie version of carl sagan's Contact. Correct. And I'm going to need you 
if you would be so kind just to take my hand and walk me through my my many many feelings and emotions about uh robert zemeckis's interpretation of carl sagan's brilliant work because i don't know exactly how i feel about it there were things i thought were great like jodie foster Mm -hmm. is great i think the movie the movie yeah as always the movie looks amazing like Mm -hmm. there's some really beautiful stuff i have seen countless like i don't know how many posts or or gifs or whatever of the mirror shot of young uh, ellie running up to the mirror and the camera pulling out i've seen that out of context so many oh, times man. that I, I actually forgot it was in this movie and when it happened i was like oh the mirror it's the mirror and i got really really excited so that was cool there's a lot of really cool technical stuff and filmmaking yeah. stuff it's beautifully shot it looks wonderful mm-hmm. but i think it is a pretty I don't want to say terrible. That's very, very mean. But the script is not great. It's not yeah. a great script. It's like somebody wanted to make, like they read Contact and they were like, mm-hmm. this is good, but can we add like um, All some- All the cor- different things. <laughs> yeah, but, like let's add like every 90s cliche. Like, oh, we got to have the quirky scientists with the Hawaiian colorful shirts who are like, yeah, man, science is cool. And like, it just made me think of like Twister, which came out the year before where like all the oh, scientists are like hip and they, oh, Twister's great. And they have like long hair and they're all like, dude, it's a tornado, man. And it's it felt like that. I was like, okay, so they fit those guys in there. They had to have the, the moment where- where um, uh, Ellie like goes to to show her proposal to like the really bored bored people. Wow, yeah. that was not. I totally didn't mean to do that. The bored board members are there, and they had you know she's like they're like we don't want to fund this, and she's like can't you guys just open your minds a little <laughs> bit? And I was like oh my god, they had that speech in the movie, and then maybe. The the thing that really irked me about it was the the Matthew McConaughey romance. I was oh, like, man. there had to be a there. Somebody read the book and said one thing's missing: she doesn't make out with anybody. Yeah. And so they threw that in there as well. So there are a lot of and and then of course there's a a big explosion, which I know is in the book. I know there's like a a. a bomb that goes off like somebody a but terrorist it's not the comes same. in yeah. yeah but in this movie it's like in in that it's like they're inside the ship and mm-hmm. it blows up the ship it disables the ship but in this movie it is a guy he runs it it's also this guy has like the most cartoon character like smile on the like when he's on the security camera and he turns and looks at the camera and smiles i um i smiled i yeah. smiled a lot i laughed i laughed and i laughed <laughs> And but the the explosion was like okay, Independence Day came out last year. Audiences are gonna be expecting something to explode. So it's a it is a major explosion that felt a little bit too much. I'm rambling a lot. Yeah. I I want I want to give no, you a chance to respond right. or refute. Am I am. I, am I being mean to this movie or do you get what I'm saying? I absolutely um, agree with you. <laughs> I I love Contact the film um yes but it's really hard to watch the movie um after you've read the book because they did change so many things Jodie Foster was great obviously like Matthew McConaughey is always a heartthrob um but yeah they they really uh they really went with a lot of the tropes there that's Um, what that's what it was is I, I think um I think that was the problem is having read the book and I'm not usually that kind of person where it's like, Oh, the book is so much better. Like I, that is going to be me in this episode, but I in general am able to kind of look at like, Oh, well the book is one thing and the movie is the other thing. And I can appreciate them for what they are. But in this particular case, because the book was so great and I loved so much of what the book did. And Mm -hmm. the fact that the movie kind of was like, well, American audiences aren't going to really yeah. go for the whole like f- philosophical God versus the uh, science and da, da, da. Yeah. they do that in the movie. Honestly, they do it an impressive amount and then they go overboard and turn it into kind of a parody. Like I don't remember it's been, again, it's been a couple years since I read the book, but I don't remember this, 
there being the scientist who is like, we need people to go on this mission who believe in God because, and I believe in God. Like when he's yeah. like looking at the camera and he's like, our, our God given rights. And it was, it just felt yeah. really, really ham fisted and overboard. And I was like, I don't remember any of this being in the book. Yeah. There, there was a lot of different things in the book um, that I think really changed the movie and what Carl Sagan was trying to go with. I mean, I can't obviously speak for Carl Sagan, but I've read enough of his uh, literature to know uh, exact, like how he was trying to mold things philosophically. Like one of the big things that changed from the movie compared to the books was how many people got to go on this trip, right? Mm -hmm. In this trip, it was just Jodie Foster. But in the book, um, there was uh, five seats. So uh, five five people from across the world um, got to go and experience this. And the way Carl Sagan wrote it in the book, it was really beautiful because it was um, really uh, uniting for um, the entire world to send all of these, you know, earth ambassadors to right. these alien, to this alien creature. And he was able to pull so much of the culture. Um, and it's also very relevant for um, today's time. It, it even talked about like, uh, the the Americans and uh, what was the Soviets and um, just uh, the way that we communicate within the science community, uh, nation wise, military wise. He really understood um, because he lived it. You know mm-hmm. that he was he was not only a cosmologist but he was um, a science communicator and worked in so many different fields. Um, he he really knew what it was like um if an if such an event did occur yeah um he knew what uh the the different sects of the world would how they would cooperate with the military and everything else and so i love that he pulled the fact that there was um these ambassadors from all over the world to go to this alien to to this alien land and i think that uh obviously it, i mean maybe it would have been too complicated for the film you know you know i understand it um d- like dramatically i understand it like yeah. there are a couple reasons why like i get why they did it for the movie because you want it to just be jodie foster like you said it's a little bit more complicated if it's all right we got to get all these different characters yeah. and they all have to have their own experiences but i think one of the things that the movie if the movie wasn't so long and it had really just homed in and focused on the faith versus fact Mm -hmm. idea, which is really, I I mean, that was so well done in the book and the movie does it, but it also is so focused on like, there's also a romance and there's also cool alien stuff. And there's also the, the evil, (laughs) the evil villain who wants to blow everything up. Like, and there's also John Hurt uh, as as a crazy billionaire, but we'll get to that. But <laughs> I think I think the thing that in the reason there's a strength to just her going is because she's now the only person on the planet right. who has this experience. Like when they all come back in the book, it's kind of a shared experience where they're all kind of like. They're going to make us think we're crazy, but we're not crazy. This really, really happened. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she has to go on her faith alone Mm -hmm. makes for a very, it's a really strong reinforcement of the theme of the film, which is basically like there are things we don't understand and it's okay that we, we can be okay with that. Like it's all right to be a person of science, but also a person of faith. Right. Which is very looked down upon. Right, uh, exactly. Nowadays, it's like it's this thing. Um, you can't have one. You have to pick, pick a side. And it's, it's, it's. We surprising. can't love Star Trek and Star Wars. <laughs> we have to love one or the other. Yeah, and and it's actually surprising. I feel like it's painted a lot in the media that um, this idea of like you have to be secular in order yeah. to be a scientist. I know plenty of incredibly brilliant people that have uh, different faiths. And, um, I, I like that. I mean, Carl Sagan painted it so beautifully in his, in his book about, um, I think, uh, a little bit of the struggle of, uh, faith versus science. And he painted, um, you know, the, the, um, the stereotypical 
person in the book um, who was who was one of uh, the pastors, yeah. uh, Run- Runken, Rankin, Rankin, I, I believe his name was, um, as the stereotypical like kind of evangelist who's who's kind of like blowing faith out of proportion, right? And um, but what he did with Palmer Joss in the book is he made him a lot more centered. Um, a lot yeah. more curious, a lot, I think, um, from, from what I've seen, um, um, a lot more true to what, you know, Christian belief is yeah. or could be, um, yeah. which is why it was so interesting to me at first. I did not understand why in the film, um, they, uh, had a relationship with, Ellie and um, Palmer Josh, because in the book, it's because. But they, I, I, they I were like, yours. all right, we did a we did a poll, <laughs> we did we took a poll, and it turns out '90s audiences demand romances in their films. Yeah. So put a romance in it. Rewrite uh, well, right now. We got to put a romance in. Well, that's well, in 100% the one hundred percent why. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, and it's interesting because in the book, um, Ellie did have a relationship. She yeah. had she had a relationship with the presidential advisor, and which. Very is what dry. Drum yeah. I, I feel like it's very in the background. Like it's like very much like she'll go home and they'll have a conversation. Like yeah. I mean, I may be wrong again. I'm not as it's not as fresh in my mind, but right. like from what I recall, it's not I mean, the romantic portion is obviously not a central feature of that story. And Absolutely. the rela- her relationship with her husband is not necessarily like the central focal point of that story either. So the romantic stuff, I think it kind of, it's almost, it, it to me, it it almost cheapens it a bit. Like, it, it's not like, you know, it's not like Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey are bad or anything, but it the inclusion and the way it's written and the way it's like very, very, like they, they meet and they're immediately like, oh my God, oh wow. Like they meet at the, the wherever they are, the, the bar or whatever. Right. And, and he's like, can I buy you a drink? And she's like, no, I'm just a scientist. I'm like, I, I, I'm wearing glasses. My hair is a mess. No, why would you want to date me? And then like they they immediately sleep together. And it was creepy because he he says the, I know this is a Carl Sagan quote, which is like, it would be an awful waste of space. Like the whole thing of like, if the universe, if there's nothing else in the universe, it would be an awful waste of space, which is lovely. I'm glad they are uh, paying homage to Carl Sagan but it's something her dad had said to her earlier and it just makes it so creepy that he says that to her and she's like you want to get out of here and then the next scene is them in bed together and I was like he quoted her dad to her and then they banged and this is very (laughs) she needs to she needs to go there's some serious psychological implications right here that I think need to be examined but that was it was like it I would almost completely cut the first 40 minutes out of this movie. Mm, like yeah. them, them pre like us needing to see them meet and see their like blossoming romance or whatever right. is almost completely unnecessary. And it just sort of at the end when he's like, the real reason I didn't vote to let you go is because I love you too much. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. And it felt like the, the material and the central story, which is, a, you know, it's already, it's like they, I feel like if you made this movie today, you could. It's basically yeah. Arrival, like the movie Arrival, which is a better movie um, than Contact, yeah. or in my opinion. It's essentially the same, same idea. It's very, though. very, very it similar. Is, it was clearly um, inspired by it. Yeah, absolutely. And so it, it's nowadays you could get away with something more yeah. contemplative as a mainstream big budget project they're not always successful but they you can get away with it a little bit more but in the 90s when you're talking about robert zemeckis <laughs> attached to a, a sci-fi film in the mid nineties following independence day, I can just see the wheels turning and then like, this is going to sound terrible, but I feel like when Carl Sagan passed away during production, it was like, somebody said, all right, is he gone? All right, quick, put the romance in the movie and something like that. Like it just, I feel like the material itself 
is so strong and so interesting mm -hmm. that when they add these cliches and these tropes that you just find in all these other movies at this time, I just am like, I, I didn't need or want any of this in this yeah. movie. Well, well, I will say this and, and may I say, uh, May I talk about why I think the uh, why he incorporated this romance? You may, you okay. may, you have thank the you, floor, sir. Amber. No, oh, thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, in uh, as we did, as we said, like uh, Ellie was, you know, dated the presidential advisor, which you know in the film they turned Dr Drumlin into the presidential advisor, and then she had the relationship with Joss, but and which I didn't understand, right? I was like, this isn't in the book at all, but then. I read the last conversation that Palmer Joss and Ellie had, and it was when Ellie had come back from um, this trip that has totally transformed her idea of the universe. And she's talking with this, you know, reverend or uh, pastor, I'm actually not quite sure the difference, but um, about how, how she, um, isn't being understood, and this is in the book, being not being understood uh, because she doesn't have strong evidence about uh, what she has seen. And it's interesting because it's a flip of the switch, whereas Palmer Joss is now being the skeptic, uh, but also being very open to what she has to say mm -hmm. because in his words, he, has, he, he says something along the lines where... Your account may be extremely strange, but I've heard it before, right? And it's this really beautiful conversation between someone from, um, you know, who's devout and someone who has spent their life dedicated to science. Yeah. And at the very, very end of the conversation, Palmer Joss asks Ellie if uh, she has ever been in love. And Ellie says something like, yeah, half, uh, like halfway, half a dozen times. Mm -hmm. And then she asks, Palma Joss, have you? And he says, no, but I have faith. And that was the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think that cliffhanger, um, and it was kind of hinted in it, in the book that um, Ellie kind of was like, oh, okay, what, is, what does that mean? Are you like hinting that, that you might be in love, that they might be in love? Because they, at the end of the book, her and Palmer Joss really um, developed this beautiful relationship where it seems like he's the only one that she trusts, yeah. um, which is kind of ironic, uh, you know, compared to what happened at the beginning of the story. And so I think that they may have incorporated that cliffhanger in the book to then give them permission to turn it into a romance in the film, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, interesting, but I wish it would have been so much stronger if they didn't sleep together. If, yes. If, yeah. if they kept it where it was like this, you could tell that there was tension and there's a beautiful relationship in it. And the audience was like, I really want these two to get together. Um, the entire movie and then it didn't give it to them. I think that would have been far more powerful than Matthew McConaughey saying, yeah, I'm religious, but I don't believe in the <laughs> celibacy part. And then, then <laughs> you know, <laughs> going and having their sexual relations. Man, it totally killed what it. What a quote. <laughs> what a quote. What a I, quote. I am 100% on board with that version of the movie because it's, it's the book. It's true to the book. You could even like ha add more implications, add more romantic subtext to this relationship. Mm -hmm. As long as it's more like a Mulder Scully thing, you know yes! what I mean? Or at least oh, Mulder perfect, Scully yeah. before Mulder and Scully became a romantic relationship. Right. Late, 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 late. Oh, in the series. Man, sorry that... to spoil everybody. <laughs> oh my God. I'm so sorry. Or a cheers thing. Did you ever watch cheers? No, but I understand Mulder and Scully. So we Mulder can... and Scully is good. I think that's great. The... Since I spoiled X-Files, I'll spoil cheers as well. So Do I'm it. sorry. At a certain point, there's like a, will they, won't they romantic relationship in that series. And when, that romantic relationship was fulfilled a few seasons in. I don't know the exact, I'm not a cheers expert, but I know this much when that romantic relationship was fulfilled and the two characters got together, the ratings dropped 
because people what they realize is they like they wanted them to get together but they didn't yeah. actually want them to be together they just yeah. wanted it like there's more to me there's more romance in the like oh it'll never it, it could have it might have but it never panned out yeah. and that is more interesting and unfortunately in the 90s <laughs> Uh, and there are great this is I mean I'm this is a blanket statement because some of the best movies ever made were made in the 90s I yes 100% but I think with this kind of film this genre at this particular point in time in cinema they couldn't do that I, I guarantee you if a draft had been turned in of the script where the relationship was platonic some producer said well you know the we got to get some ladies in the seats and ladies love romance and we're gonna we got to make sure we reach that demographic so we have to make sure it's and it makes me so sad because that's what i mean it's like it's it's almost and it's not you know it's not intentionally like trying to piss all over carl sagan's legacy but there's a feeling of condescension to it where it's like they did not trust the central conceit of the film Mm. which is the you know again it's already to me and i may be you know i'm sure i'm a film snob i'm not your average moviegoer i guess but to me that is so much more interesting all the stuff the philosophical stuff the conversations in the book the things where they're talking about like what does the existence of extraterrestrial life mean for a creator of the universe right. what does it mean when the person of science has to go off of faith and has to like admit they don't know those that to me is the best stuff and anytime the adaptation sticks with the book like to me like the first i i made a joke about it but i mean it i think like the flashbacks of her with her dad and the the meeting matthew mcconaughey and them getting their their funding pulled the first time (laughs) all that stuff is so unnecessary like maybe some stuff with the dad you could throw in because i get they want us to see what the dad looks like so at the end when we see him again we know who he is but it felt like unnecessary and it's 40 minutes of this stuff and the movie really doesn't start until after that point it jumps ahead four years and i remember thinking like what is going on four years later what happened did none of that stuff that happened before even really matter and the answer is it didn't really because then they get it opens with uh with her sitting with the uh what is it the big array what is it called uh the very large array very large array, which yeah, is the a VLA. fantastic, yeah. fantastic name. Fantastic Astronomers name. are really great at naming stuff. I was about to <laughs> say, like, like, this is so big. scientific. <laughs> <laughs> Very large array. So she's sitting there, and that would have been a great way to introduce her character. It's a great shot, and you know, the Beautiful, satellites. It's iconic. It, it's wonderful. It's great. And then they do redo the we're pulling funding again. And I'm like, wait, there didn't they just almost get their funding pulled? And now they're doing that again. And then they hear the noise so i just like i think if you cut that out and then you introduce uh uh palmer joss i feel like i want to say his full name all the time it's like palmer joss palmer Palmer joss Joss, where are you get in here we're having (laughs) dinner like bring in the the little triangle but like i I, that's i love how we give it a a southern accent for no reason (laughs) it feels like a name like palmer joss like i feel like it needs a southern accent but i just i think if you the movie's too long. So you cut those 40 minutes out and you bring it to under two hours. The pacing has helped mm-hmm. and you don't really, I started to realize I was like, yeah, cause then she can see him at that, uh, wherever they, they are reunited at the conference or the, the banquet or whatever it was. I don't even remember, but like, you could just have that implication of like, Oh, there's a past there. Like there's a past relationship right. and, that, like things like that like you didn't really need to see it all because it throws off the pacing of the movie and Agreed. it's weird it's weird but that said the best parts for me first of all i loved the opening shot the opening shot was uh it tricked me because uh the opening shot is the you see the earth and then i think for what two or three minutes it just like keeps pulling back and pulling back and pulling back and you see all the different planets all these different noises and radio stations are playing and i was like oh this is going to be super cerebral it's going to be like kubrick it's going to be really slow and interesting and that was quickly dashed uh by (laughs) the following scenes but that was great and also um the stuff 
of them when they first hear the sound like the scientists just talking this is i was watching this and it was done with such confidence and the filmmaking is so exciting the way they're talking to each other and i don't know what they're saying i have no clue but they seem fascinated and excited about it so i as a viewer am excited about it and all i'm thinking is this is so much more interesting than anything that's happened so far in this movie. Yeah. And it's all science talk. It's all yeah. the stuff that like, I guarantee you the, the big studio execs behind their desks are saying, we can't, they're chomping cigars. And they're like, we can't have the science talk in this movie. People want explosions. And to me, I'm watching this thinking like, this is the most exciting part. Absolutely. The movie, I'm sure for you, like as being super into this stuff, you're like, yes, this is it. This, these exactly. are the moments, but it did feel like I was like, oh, the movie's finally getting started and it only took 45 minutes or so. <laughs> it really does feel like that. It, it, it is extremely slow. Uh, but I absolutely agree with you. Um, the opening sequence of the um, chattering of the radio, uh, of the, the radio um, noise outside of Earth. And then as you pull out, because of the way that, uh, you know, light travels in general, as you move away from its source it loses energy right so it gets quieter and quieter and quieter was and then we're upset by the film because there are sounds in space and we all know no there is no sound in outer space people. there is in radio light and that's that's what the radio telescope does so the radio uh... telescope picks up radio light so you know how you have a radio in your car i don't know if you mm. know this but i i didn't know i had a radio in my car let I me, let, let this. me i'm uh, gonna research uh, this and i will be right back this is a eureka moment you just found yeah, that out okay amazing. so 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 just a quick a quick science les- lesson about uh the electromagnetic spectrum <clears throat> Radio light. Um, I like that you had to clear your throat. You're like, <laughs> it, it, my throat suddenly got dry because it's like, girl, shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. This is great. This is it's great. It's like you talk about this all the time. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm ready. Okay, okay. So really quickly, um, on the electromagnetic spectrum, there is uh, different types of light that exist uh, throughout our universe. Now, radio light is uh, the weakest signal that can exist. We, for example, see invisible light. Radio is all the way on the uh, low part of the spectrum. And uh, when you turn on your radio, it's actually tuning into a radio frequency. So it's converting that light that is traveling on those radio waves and turning it into sound. So that is essentially what, that's kind of what a radio telescope does. So it's looking out into the cosmos looking for these radio signals because even though radio signals are quote unquote the weakest wavelength of light that exists it also travels the farthest so we could we pick up radio signals all the time and uh convert it into data so when you're watching that first scene um, with earth and the uh, noise of like people talking and everything that's mm-hmm. supposed to emulate our radio signals that are leaving earth from television, from radio stations, and it's permeating out into the cosmos. But as you pull back, because that radio signal is getting weaker and weaker and mm-hmm. weaker, it's getting quieter and quieter and quieter. And then you leave past Jupiter and Uranus and ne- Neptune and you're outside of that Oort cloud and all of a sudden it's silent but it's actually not silent it, there's weak signals constantly permeating throughout the cosmos from as far as we know just us but we're looking for those radio te- uh, signals from other civilizations um, that might you know be sending us a signal of of uh, Hitler so they might be sending us a signal of this film <laughs> of like they're like film. we've been watching this film and we have some thoughts we have some thoughts about this. Why? It's a film review. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's just them reviewing the They're film. They're like, look. But yeah. But I love, I love all of that stuff. Like, I just love, that was the stuff that, of course, I remember from the book and the stuff right. that really excited me from the book is like, they hear the signal. Then they start to, de- like, decipher what is the signal? What is it sending us? And then the Hitler right. stuff. And then they realize, like, oh, it's overlaid over a different image. And then there's a cipher and we have to figure out what it means. All that stuff is awesome. And I wish um, 
and they really film, simplified it in the fi- in the film. They do, they do, which is okay. I get that, but the, it does right. feel like they rush through it because they're like, "We got to get back to Matthew McConaughey," and I'm like, <laughs> "No, I want this stuff." And it's just like, it's funny because you know the um, the blind scientist who's in the movie, who I believe is based on another real scientist. Oh, is it? I think so, but he like he's kind of there as like the the like cute best friend that yeah. you know it's kind of like the puppy dog scientist who she has a friendship with and he like it, it almost would have made more sense for that character to be the romance but you know yeah. he's not matthew mcconaughey so right. i'm sorry he is in the dark knight though he's in the beginning of the dark knight he is the guy with the shotgun <laughs> in the bank who starts shooting the clowns and i was like i haven't seen him in any other movie now i can say i saw him in contact but uh that's neither here nor there the point is that i really don't know where i was going with this i completely (laughs) lost my train of thought what was i saying no all that stuff is really really great i really loved that and i wish that like they the filmmakers had trusted in Mm. i don't know that they didn't trust the material because there is a surprising amount of the like talk of god and like belief in god and things like that it comes way too late in the movie like they start talking about the existence of god uh maybe an hour plus into the film i know there's a scene with her and the preacher after her dad dies where he's like there's a greater plan and she's like if only the medicine had been on the first floor and that's like all they talk Yeah. yeah that's what like you know sent her on a spiral of like i need to approach science and and i hate you god but it's like to me i i wanted again i that's all interesting and fascinating to me and that's a that's something that we all in our own ways have to struggle with like in general it's like where did we come from why are we here is there a greater being that created all of this what does that mean what are the implications and what does the existence of aliens what kind of wrench does that throw into everything that stuff is so fascinating so it's just it makes me so frustrated when they're kind of like all right we got to breeze over all this like interesting stuff to get back to the the cliched like nonsensical like the bad guy who's gonna steal ellie's spot on the spaceship because he's a jerk and things like that and even you know the the book does a really great job of like her you know she's she is a woman in this field where it is not necessarily easy for her to be respected and they kind of touch on that a little bit but they don't really i don't need it to be like in your face but they really bury it in this movie really hard yeah Yeah. and i like as somebody who like I get really annoyed when it's like really like it's like this is a woman and hear her roar like I get really like I am so sensitive to that stuff and I so appreciated the way the book felt so organic and natural and was really commenting on it without like hitting you over the head with this but this movie just gets rid of it completely and that was another thing that was so great about this story is it's like you could just focus on her you don't need a romance you can focus on her struggles to be respected in a field where it's like difficult to be respected where because of her gender it's difficult for her to be like on many many levels it's like i don't you're you're throwing in all these tropes and things that are so unnecessary because there are so many interesting ideas here and maybe the the concept of ideas quote unquote is what scared the execs at the time is like yeah. we don't have we don't have time for ideas we need we need the, wh- when does the cgi start where is the special effects you know like so that's what that's what i think bothered me is like it kept shifting away from the interesting stuff to kind of get back to the stuff that they i guess thought audiences wanted to see yeah and i and i i agree with you i think uh the way Carl Sagan uh, painted Ellie's character is it really highlighted uh, her struggles in a very real way. <laughs> I had to laugh in uh, in the one scene where uh, they're announcing Bill Clinton. Bill Bill Clinton is <laughs> is the president, which in the I I mean I understand they're trying to connect with like a with a generation life, because it's relevant, yeah. right? But in the book, it was a woman. It was a female pre- president. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but she like call he calls up drum. Uh, no no no. He calls up 
the person who has led this uh, project from the very beginning. And then Ellie starts like moving through the cr- the crowd, getting ready to mm-hmm. talk. And then, and then she, he goes drumlin and then drumlin like, just like pushes past her. And it's like this really right. like dramatic it's, moment. That's what and I'm I was, like, saying. Oh. It, it, it's so, <laughs> and look, so I, 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 I said it before. I'll say it again. I love Robert Zemeckis, but, I have not seen Forrest Gump in a long time. Um, I would like to watch it again. I have very fond memories of watching it. But that said, that is a movie that I'm afraid to watch again because I am fearful that it will be more obnoxious than endearing, if that Mm. makes sense. It's a film that like it wants to make you cry. It's very saccharine and it's very sweet. But it's also like a very manipulative film. And I feel like because Zemeckis won the Oscar for Forrest Gump at one best picture, he, I think, leaned into those impulses with contact, like things that are very cliched, like that guy, like shoving past her or the music. And I love Alan Silvestri, but the score is very whimsical and like Mm -hmm. magical in a way that is like it's too whimsical and it plays at the wrong times. I think it plays, does it play in her boardroom scene where she's just like, I feel like it plays at all the moments, like where it's like really pronouncing, we want you to feel this way. Like when she's like, I just want to believe that these things exist. The music's like, (laughs) and I'm just sitting there like, God, this is really, really annoying. So I think Zemeckis as a filmmaker at this point in his career was making creative choices that kind of follow that same train of thought of like sentimental sappy like too in your face when more subtlety could have really really benefited the film but that moment you pointed out is is perfect like it's the best example there's a lot of that in the movie the other one again i mentioned it before but it it, i laughed so hard but the the evil uh terrorist who is on the surveillance camera and just turns and the smile on his face it is one of the best things in uh cinema history it I is so bad put that out there and it it's is, just that like, scene wh- is so bad it is what it's like why why you didn't have to do that no. like uh, like are do you really think i just again the the studio exec is like yeah uh, we don't have a shot of him just like smiling evilly into the camera. <laughs> Can we get that? I don't know if audiences are going to understand that he's a bad guy if he doesn't smile like a like a complete insane person. Um, oh, by the way, with the Bill Clinton stuff, they had real footage of Bill Clinton talking about something else, and they did not get permission for that. Did no, you? No, know? I did not know that. I know I knew it was real footage, but I did not yeah. know that they didn't get permission. We, Sarah came in and was like, "Why is Bill Clinton in the movie?" And I was like, "I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what's happening." And they took like he was talking about, um, like they discovered some sort of like rocks on Mars or something had happened with Mars and the verbiage from the speech that he gave just perfectly aligned with contact, like with it, like he could have been talking about extraterrestrial life. So they hijacked the footage Mm -hmm. and put it in the film and they did not get permission from Clinton or anybody. Oh my gosh. I I I knew, I knew that they, they, they got it from an actual, uh, press conference that he gave but i had no idea that they're just like yeah we're just gonna use this yeah (laughs) so that's that's fantastic um i want to talk about john hurt as what's his name the the uh, billionaire is it uh, hayden hayden yeah yeah can we talk about him for a little bit because i that was utterly that was the other thing where i was like this this movie is trying so hard to be a 90s movie Mm. like when she when he she's like you got a call from somebody and then she goes into this like i don't know james bond villains lair in an airplane Mm. and john hurt is basically a james bond villain and he's bald and he's going "Mm -hmm." welcome ellie welcome to my lair i was just like what is this and was like i don't remember any of this being in the book and if it's not and i know hayden like i was going back through and i was like okay so hayden 
is the person who funds and is the person who kind of helps her right. make the breakthroughs with building the machine. But I don't remember it being this stupid. <laughs> it definitely wasn't, Carl. I mean, okay. the thing the thing is, is Hayden was kind of crazy in the book, and he was yeah. like this very obnoxious, like uh, eccentric. I don't know if, yeah, ec- eccentric is better than ec- obnoxious. I, I stand corrected. Yeah. Um, billionaire in the in the book who like you know who he, he creates a a. I can't remember the biblical city that he modeled it out of. I, it might have not even what, Babylon been Babylon or uh, yeah, something like I think it sure. might have been Babylon. But <laughs> but he uh yeah, I mean the book really developed him in a way better way. Um yeah. And uh he didn't discover the primer in the book. Um so they they just gave him a lot of they used him for a lot of just like connections right and he was just like this one character that they really got carried away (laughs) yes yeah it was just the word wacky that i used to describe contact that that was it the (laughs) movie the movie almost completely lost me during that scene because i was like this am I in like, what am I watching? It was like, I put on a completely different movie. I was like, this is not contact. I don't know what this is because it just, again, it felt like maybe that scene had been written to have him like, Oh, he's just like sitting in an office or he's like in a mansion. They were like, no, what can we do to get like audiences really excited? And there's a mystery element and what is going, and it just felt like, again, he, it, it looks like, it's so overblown. And then he he's like, Ellie, I know everything about you. And he has like a, a slideshow of her I know, home videos. I know. And oh I'm my like, gosh. what the hell is happening? I what is going on? laughed so hard when they go back to that press conference that I referenced earlier. And he has a picture of Drumlin like passing her, yeah. like bumping past her. And I was like, <laughs> why that picture? I... It's like her like, oh. Like, I know he happened. He's like, get that moment, get that <laughs> moment. I know that's going to be great for the slideshow I'm putting together. <laughs> I, I just, it, it was, it is, it is, you know, it is a blatantly stupid scene in a film that is trying. I don't know. The film is totally weird, but in general, it wants to be taken seriously. So when you throw in scenes like that, again, they didn't they didn't trust the material and they were like throw in a wacky science character so audiences don't get bored and have him explain things to her like it just it felt so it felt so wrong yeah and then and then at the end when he dies and it's just like they don't really explain what the relevance is of him dying like it just, they just show him being covered up in a body bag and it was like okay so he's dead now okay fine um, and in the book, I think the the idea is like, oh, he died, and now it's starting to look like a conspiracy because maybe this this whole alien thing was just an invention to yeah. fund your crazy well, wacky project. Well, it was it was his own conspiracy. Yeah, in, in yeah. the in the book, he yeah. he kind of created it that way. Exactly. Um, so, but, but it, they, the but movie they doesn't took, really. Yeah. They just got all the good stuff out. They're like, yeah, exactly. yeah we'll give you this, but meh, like the actual explanation of the situation, we're not going to give you. So just yeah, take exactly. it as you will. So uh, as as I've been hating on, is that what the kids say? Hating on hating, the yeah, film? I, I feel like I've been throwing a lot of negativity towards the film. A film that you love, and I understand why. I love like, it there's for a lot its of, nostalgia well, but and there's its good stuff, to the book. But there is good stuff in it. Like yeah. it's like I said, it's beautifully yeah. shot. It looks great. Um, I love again, I love the stuff that's actually from the book. Mm-hmm. Specifically the stuff of the like the sound of the uh the message is mm-hmm. so good and it like gave me the oh I got shivers. Like it was like oh I love it so much. And I found out later I was looking into the sound. Apparently it's like a variation on the TARDIS from Doctor Who. No way. Yeah. That's Do so you watch cool. Doctor Who? Because you should. I know. It's funny. It's all um, about space and time. I know. So, I need know. to I need to delve into uh Doctor Who. I've into- I've uh I've dabbled, but I need to really um immerse myself in that world because it totally is right up my my alley 
that was really great. I wish they'd relied a little bit more again on just, I don't need the, the musical score to tell me how to feel like little moments like that when they're listening to the sound and it's like creepy and amazing. And they're all excited. Like, I was like, this is great. I also really loved, um, there was the scene where they're driving in and all the people are outside yes. and they're just crazy people. And the first time she sees that stu- the stupid guy who ends up blowing up the machine. Yeah. Um, but the first time she sees him and he looks at her and it's genuinely unsettling. And then she rolls up her window and you can see, still see his reflection yeah. in there. I love that so much. There's a lot of great filmmaking and it makes me so annoyed that they like, just the script is so messed up and i was looking into the script as well i was like who wrote this thing like why is this so silly and uh it turns out so the gentleman who co-wrote this i hope they're not listening um michael goldenberg and james hart hopefully uh nobody that i named just now is listening to this episode but one of them would go on to write green lantern the green lantern film um yes uh the less said about that the better and then the other one wrote laura croft tomb raider the cradle of life Hmm. um muppet treasure island Ooh, i love me some muppets muppets are great um hook he wrote hook (gasps) which you know is a a a lovely film that i think if you hadn't seen it as a, a kid, you probably wouldn't like as much. Um, uh, that's that might be true, but I love Hook. it. Might be true. I haven't. Uh, that's another one I'm avoiding watching because I'm scared. Um, yeah, but this is all to say, like, not uh, these guys. Like, I just I didn't need Matthew McConaughey at the end to say I didn't. I did it because I love you. Right. But I loved the um, the wormhole stuff. Like when she finally goes in the wormhole. That's amazing. How did you feel about all of that stuff? Did that feel like aligned with what you would hope for it to be having read the book? Not necessarily no. scientifically accurate. How do you feel about it? I, I think it worked for the film. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, the that whole traveling to uh, the uh, vegans – vegans yeah. i think it should be vegans vegans, vegans is it weird. should be vegans uh, when i was reading it on the page i was like wait a second <laughs> vegans vegans um but i mean it was so drastically different from um what happened in the book that mm. i just kind of had to um let go of what i read in order no. to convince myself of the movie and it, and it worked for the film and then going on to the beach that beach part was integral to the book so they they got that right and the conversation with the father um you know they they uh yeah that that i mean that whole scene is just completely different from the book so yeah that's how i, I the beach stuff i didn't because it's like oh they're standing on a blue screen <laughs> like it just it kind <laughs> of like um you know it, it's even with like modern day effects, even with it looks you like an do. old PC background. Yeah, <laughs> and and they both look weird because mm. I guess I think they did some color correction. Like mm. this is maybe one of the earliest uses of like intense color correction to make sure that like the effects and the the people standing on the blue screens look like they're standing where they're supposed to be. Um, it just looks off to me. And I remember reading the book and feeling this sense of awe and like, it really feels more otherworldly. Not that it, I mean, th- there are things about it that feel weird because it, frankly, it looks so fake in the movie, but okay. I, I was disappointed by that scene specifically because I remembered it so fondly from the book and how dreamlike it was and it's so esoteric and it's not quite reality and are there like aren't there doesn't am i crazy is there like a door or something yeah yeah there's a door there's a door in the in the book there's just like so much more weird uh stuff that's like gonna freak you out like yeah. you know smoke something and watch this moment if you could interpret the book visually it's like that's what you want and the movie is just kind of like and they're on a a, a colorful beach yeah. that doesn't look real and there are some cool stars and that's it and it i'm kind of like it doesn't do it justice at yeah, all yeah it's just it's, underwhelming yeah. it's underwhelming but i did appreciate that they included the kind of um 
coda at the end of just uh, or i don't know if coda is the right term the epilogue of her coming back and nobody believing her mm-hmm. and again i do think it's really effective to have her being the only person going because then she it's like all right well i'm the only person who saw this so i have to but i have to believe it like i have right. to take it on faith um, it, w- it would have been an infinitely longer movie if <laughs> yeah, they if yes. they incorporated all five of the original characters exactly in the book. Um, exactly and and what it meant after uh they came back from earth because they all now have to go their separate ways and um there's there's a line from i believe ada in the original book that that says something along the lines of you know as you grow older uh, the memories are going to get farther from you and you have to like mm-hmm. forget you ha- or you have to remember you can't forget right. uh, you have to hold on to the memories this did happen don't convince yourself otherwise and I thought that was yeah. a really powerful moment there's so many powerful moments that because they stripped away those characters it doesn't um, make the film what it is but but yeah. you know you, you take what you got in Hollywood yeah yeah I it, that's again I'm, I'm like you take what you got but at the same time why did you get rid of the good <laughs> like you didn't have to why get did that? you they, get got that stuff it, why did you <laughs> exactly like it's like Sagan wrote it for you you could have just copied and pasted like you could have just put that in your script but um I didn't I liked Matthew McConaughey's final little like I for one believer but um I didn't Again, the cliche of the the reporter. Hey, Matthew, Matthew McConaughey. Or no, I'm sorry. Uh, why did I forget his name? Palmer I had so Joss. Much Palmer Joss. Oh my gosh. Palmer, hey, Palmer Joss. I'm such a failure. Oh my god. Fail. I should just quit podcasting. <laughs> um, but like when they're like Palmer, Palmer Joss. What do you What do you have to say? And and he just turns and it's like the the whole everyone outside just shuts up to listen to him. And it's like oh my god. Like it. It's silly. It's silly. But I did appreciate that um, they included that stuff because I thought that was really. It was really cool. Like, it's it, well, it's not really cool, but it's it's sad. But it's also I think that reinforces, again, the idea that Ellie has to kind of uh, forfeit her strongly held beliefs to mm-hmm. accept the unknown a little bit. And I loved that. And I loved that yeah, the movie included it was, that. So. Yeah, it was an extremely important theme in the book that Carl Sagan ex- explored. So they, if they didn't have that in there, it would have just been a complete fail. Disaster. Yeah, disaster. Yeah. Um, so even if they did incorporate it in a, you know, corny way, they, they yeah. had to. It, it's a relative i mean it's still the movie it's funny that all these cliched moments and these things that were clearly designed to make it more appealing to uh an audience didn't help like the movie still didn't make money (laughs) like it didn't like it was it's still too unconventional Mm. really honestly despite the best attempts of the filmmakers it's still a little too slow it's not exciting in a think blow em up action movie kind of way. And I admire that as well. And it bums me out that they didn't just embrace that and yeah. like just accept it, especially considering the fact that the movie didn't make money at the end of the day. So it's yeah. like, it didn't really matter. You could have just held on to the, the original idea, the original scenes, the original moments. You didn't have to fit in all these really, really, awful little bits that are hysterical but yeah. like really undermine the material because yeah. it would have i was about to say it would have paid off it didn't pay off yeah. it didn't pay off literally it did not but well, well the film is also a pro- product of its time like like the, yeah uh, they they really didn't have those kind of freedoms to be able to uh i i'm sure that this this f- script was rewritten hundreds of times mm-hmm. um because I'm sure like Carl Sagan, but also his widow Andrew and probably had um, a lot to say about the script. Um, And, uh, but because, you know, people weren't as open, we we don't have all of the wonderful things like streaming services where creators are able to, um, you know, kind of (laughs) uh, tell the story that they want to, instead of like having these crazy studios. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, To to a very certain extent. Well, I think, and we've also seen like the success of films that maybe otherwise wouldn't have been successful, Mm -hmm. which opens the doors for more risk taking, at least in a mainstream sense. But um, yeah, I, I, great, great book, but not great adaptation. And Mm -hmm. 
but that for no for reasons that escape me like it's like the this movie should have been greater okay. yeah 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 but i but also like i don't like, I don't know. Do you think this is something like, obviously I hadn't seen it and I'm watching it now. Do you still think this is a movie that like people should see? Like, do you, despite <laughs> my, our kind of like, a like kind of bashing it this whole time. Like, yeah. is this still something like you would like recommend to people like, yeah, you should check it out. Like, or would you just say like, go for the book? Um, I personally always say go for the book. Um, yeah. And especially this book. In this Carl, case, Carl absolutely. Sagan's contact is iconic and you will get the full painted picture of what his story was meant to be um but i mean the film itself i guess um it explores a theme that isn't normally explored um Mm -hmm. in film and for that reason only i'd invite people to watch it because it does make you think at the end of the day it might be silly watching some things but um it does still ask the central question even if it's done poorly um of yeah. carl sagan's book but i would strongly encourage um people especially if you love the um technical because he, he gets technical in the book but it's not mm. anything that's too overwhelming at all it's more like um just trying to truly paint the picture of um you know how it would be in the science realm and but again it's not overwhelming. it's great it's great yeah i would um liken it to uh michael crichton's jurassic park as far mm. as like technicality like yeah. michael crichton was somebody who very clearly was interested in the science right. behind it Absolutely. and steven spielberg was somebody who was just like are there dinosaurs they're dinosaurs okay great we're just running with the dinosaurs right um I feel like Contact the Movie once. <laughs> now it's not nearly as exciting as Jurassic Park or as successful as Jurassic Park yeah. the movie, but it wants to be the same thing where it's like it's a, a little bit more exciting and rip roaring and zany, but it's like yeah. Contact just isn't that, and it's mm-hmm. okay that it's not that. It's okay yeah. that it's more philosophical. I like that. Um, but as far as like technical stuff, I completely agree because as somebody who's not super into like all that tech stuff i yeah. really really enjoyed reading it i loved his prose i loved yeah. his writing style and I, mi- I i missed a lot of that in the movie yeah definitely absolutely I agree. what do you what do you think anything else you want to say any other statements that need to be made about contact or you ready to give it final ratings no other than carl sagan is is his stuff stands uh against the test of time his like even though he wrote it so long ago it's still just as relevant if you picked it up today so um agreed comparatively to i feel like if you made well if you made contact today it would be a it would be closer to the book it would be a much different movie maybe like, we I should feel write like, contact let's, let's, let's do it i think this whole podcast has been leading to this moment all right we're doing it we're writing we're adapting a new version of contact stay tuned everybody please um i'm tr- okay so final ratings mm-hmm. uh one being the lowest five being the highest mm-hmm. how many um i just i just want to say how many uh ridiculous evil smiling <laughs> preacher (laughs) bad people would you give contact on a scale from one to five for the film um for the film for the film and it's okay to grade on a scale i know like you have like your tight your heart is tied into this so so um with it by itself if i were not to compare it to the book it would be a three Okay. Uh, yeah, if I were not to compare it to the book, but if I were to compare it to the book, it would be more of like a one and a half to a oh, two. Oh man! All right. So okay. yeah, I got gotcha. you. So somewhere, let's say we'll say two and a half ish. Yeah, we'll do two and a half. If we if we and a- if we do an average, I'm not good at math. I'm not even. Yeah. I'm not, let's not do that. I'll give it two and a half. It's like I. I, I'm with you. I appreciate so much that they did try to make it a little bit more cerebral, but like they completely, they just, they couldn't commit. They couldn't commit to the bit. Yeah. But the nostalgia, man. I mean, the nostalgia of the it's film true. itself There's good is. St- I mean, Jodie Foster is, is great. And yeah. It's all that stuff. There's good stuff in it. And it's fascinating as, you know, just in terms of Robert Zemeckis's filmography, because I think Castaway was after this. I love I Castaway. Think. Yeah, it's just a what contact is such a 
Like you can do anything you want. You just directed Forrest Gump. What do you want to do? I'm going to do contacts. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. So what an interesting choice. So that's it. We did it. We made contact with contact. I love it. How do you, how do you feel? I feel great. I feel like I, I uh, vented. (laughs) You vented a little little bit out of your system. Yeah. You're a little bit lighter. It's, it's it's been boiling inside it's been of said. me for it's been years. said we've said it it's happened we're good to go well amber this has been a delight i've i've i always love talking to you and i love Same. talking with you about this film on this podcast right at this moment and if people are listening and they're like wow this amber person is like super cool how can i hear more of what she has to say where can they find you out there on the interwebs on the interwebs it is uh the best place I guess to find me would be Instagram and that's at Amber underscore Rosario. Now it's spelled A M Rosario. Um, it's spelled A M B R E is Amber underscore R O S A R I O. Okay. And I'm at Ye Shonderman on Twitter though. I haven't really been Twitter is such, oh, it's such a nasty, nasty place. People all yelling at each other, but there's some good people there, but yeah. I'm at Ye Shonderman on Twitter. If you say hi to me, I'll say hi back. I'm Shonderman05 on Letterboxd. If you want to yell at me for my terrible movie reviews and, and ratings, you can do that there. So, Amber, thank you again. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We will see you at the movies. Bye.